From MTN News, this is Montana This Morning. You see this disaster from the highway and it's a oh my moment. What we will say is that this is not a short term event. 17 trail cars, some carrying toxic chemicals derail. 10 of them come crashing right down into the Yellowstone River. Well, good morning and thanks for joining us here on Montana this morning on this Monday, June 26. I'm Kagan Harsha. This morning, we're learning that that bridge collapse derailment disaster between Columbus and Reed Point is causing some serious problems on the whole other side of the state. A fiber optics line got cut in half and now three counties in western Montana don't have emergency 911 services. Fixing that line or the bridge isn't possible until all those cars are removed from the river. As you can imagine, that's going to take a while. Trains normally bound for the southern line are being rerouted, and that will be a significant impact. Montana Rail Link officials didn't want to give an estimation for how long this will take, only saying there is no quick fix. But while touring the damage yesterday, Governor Greg Gianforte says he's actually impressed with the response already so far. We need to make sure our bridges are uh, have good integrity. This bridge that failed under this rail car was tested just as recently as May. The rails were tested more recently, according to Montana Rail Link. Uh, so uh, safety programs are critical to make sure our infrastructure is strong. Yeah, there were a lot of fears downstream over the weekend. Good news here, the, the cars that spilled were carrying some combination of asphalt, molten sulfur, or rocks. Nothing that had a huge impact on the water. Two cars, though, did have sodium hydrosulfate inside. If those would have breached, it would have contaminated the drinking water. All treatment plants in the area are now operating normally this morning, while the cause of that collapse remains under investigation. We can tell you there was actually once a driving bridge that was right next to that collapsed rail bridge. Just two years ago, it was demolished because the foundation of that bridge underneath was deemed unstable. Well, in Hardin, residents there are cleaning up from disaster as well this morning. The rainy weekend dumped nearly five inches of water there, flooding homes, businesses, even a local animal shelter. Q2's Alina Howder has more. This little pup is just one of a dozen dogs that were displaced after this week's intense flooding and heavy rains in the city of Hardin. One animal rescue's building was flooded out as well as a bunch of others in the community. <laughs> These dogs may be safe and sound right now, but that wasn't the case Saturday. It just has rained and rained and rained. Hardin residents Tammy Devers and Chris Schneider take care of 22 dogs through their nonprofit Hamster Boy and Tiger Lily Animal Rescue. But this weekend, they had their hands tied when their building flooded. So Chris, my daughter, and her husband waded through knee-deep water had to carry most of the dogs. These pups were temporarily displaced here to one of Chris's old mechanic shops after their rescue building's power had to be cut because it was underwater. And it was far from the only building in town that was flooded out. Last count I heard was approximately 15 to 20. They had water backing up, sewage backing up. Um, because of the overload in the, in the backflow. Mayor Joe Purcell says that water from irrigation ditches overflowed into the roads, flooding them out, affecting multiple events like Little Bighorn Days and the PRCA Rodeo. It was a wet Friday night and then Saturday night they had to cancel it because the road washed out. So we couldn't get spectators in, we couldn't get livestock out, so everything just kind of shut down. He said a water main did break around 11 p.m. Saturday night, leaving some homes without water. At this time, there's probably five to six homes that are completely out. Um, some other ones are limited. But now that the rains have stopped and the sun is shining, Hamster Boy and Tiger Lily Animal Rescue hopes to pick up the pieces with help from the community. We've lost medications, we've lost vaccines, because um, that stuff has to be refrigerated. We've lost food, we've lost bedding. To find out how and where you can donate to the rescue, visit our website at ktvq.com. In Hardin, Alina Howder, MTN News. Yeah, a lot of events actually planned down in Bighorn County over the weekend. Looking at some of the aerials, that was a ton of water. That a there. lot, a lot of water. They still have a flood warning in effect around Hardin. If we want to show that graphic there, it's till, officially till lunchtime today. Uh, the good news is Little Big uh, Horn River there at Hardin is, uh, let's see, eight foot is a flood stage. It's continuing to come down. It's just over seven feet right now, so it is improving. So uh, it may not make it until noon today for that warning, but definitely something you want to keep an eye on. We still have a chance to see some excessive rainfall in the area, including Hardin today. 
with more showers and thunderstorms. In fact, daily showers and thunderstorms expected all the way through at least Thursday for the area. And we'll break it down with the main forecast coming up. 55 right now at the airport. Winds out of the southwest at about 3 miles an hour. Temperatures across the area from west to east. We're in the 40s and 50s. We do have a, a little bit of rain still up there just coming out of uh, Petroleum County. Highs today with some of those showers and thunderstorms, 60s, 70s, and 80s. But you'll notice I like to call them little popcorn kernels that pick up, uh, pop up on the radar on the map there. That indicates where we could see those deep reds, heavy rainfall, and the possibility of seeing some severe weather. And there's a chance for all that today. We'll take a look with that main forecast coming up here in just a bit. All right. Thanks, Miller. Sure. Well, the wild weather this weekend also brought this. Yes, that's a tornado to Wyoming. It's being blamed for causing injuries to eight workers of the coal mine up in Campbell County near Gillette. A tornado touched down during a shift change and a group of employees were actually inside buses about to head back to base when that tornado picked the buses up, sending the men bouncing inside the cab almost miraculously here. None of those injuries were life threatening, though six people were transported to the hospital. Well, powerful storms also knocking out power to hundreds of thousands of residents throughout parts of the south and the Ohio Valley. Tornadoes there damaged more than 75 homes, killing at least one person in Indiana. More than 6 million people were under an enhanced risk for severe weather last night, and that concern also continues into today. Well, new this morning, the leader of a group of Russian mercenaries is believed to be on his way to Belarus, ending a short-lived rebellion against the Kremlin. Well, the captivating scenes of armed fighters in Russian streets have given way to more calm this morning. U.S. officials are questioning if that situation has exposed cracks in Russian President Vladimir Putin's authority. CBS's Riley Carlson has the latest. Residents cheered as Wagner mercenaries left the Russian city of Rostov, ending an hours-long revolt launched by the group's leader, Yevgeny Prigozhin. Prigozhin seized the city and began to advance towards Moscow over the weekend after blaming the Russian military of targeting and killing his men with a missile strike in Ukraine. Russian defense officials have denied it. Russian President Vladimir Putin called Prigozhin a traitor on Russian state TV Saturday, but later accepted a deal brokered by the leader of Belarus to allow him to live in exile in the neighboring country without prosecution. The Kremlin also agreed to pardon his fighters. This is an unfolding story and I think uh, we're in the midst of a moving picture. We haven't seen we haven't seen the last act. On CBS Face the Nation, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken hinted that the situation raised questions about Putin's grip on power. It was a direct challenge to Putin's authority so this raises profound questions. It, it shows real cracks. <laughs> It all comes as Ukrainian forces are weeks into a counteroffensive. Officials in Ukraine say they're making progress towards Bakhmut. I think what Ukraine needs to do is press every advantage it has to use this moment to get its territory back. Over the weekend, President Biden spoke to Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky about the war and, quote, recent events in Russia. Riley Carlson, CBS News, London. President Biden also discussed the war in Ukraine and that security situation in Russia yesterday in a phone call with Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Well, Montana Republicans are starting to receive some threatening letters very similar to those seen in Tennessee and Kansas recently. Montana Highway Patrol is investigating mail just sent to House Speaker Matt Regeer that contained a white powder. Suspicious letters were also mailed to Representatives Neil Durham of Eureka and Rhonda Knutson of Culbertson. You may recall the same thing happened to several GOP lawmakers in Tennessee last week and two weeks ago in Kansas. It's unclear if all this is connected. More than 100 elected officials in Kansas actually received those similar threatening letters. Well, progress and innovation are often associated with the car industry, but more and more companies are now looking in the rearview mirror when it comes to driving their businesses forward. Reporter Dan Grossman takes a closer look at how younger generations are now hopping on board the nostalgia bandwagon. So this is where it all began. When we sat shotgun with Doug Shook, he took us for a joyride through the side roads of Denver. GTO is one of the founders of the term muscle car. But even as he powered through the four-speed manual transmission with a punch that would throw a camera in your face. I almost put my eye out. <laughs> it was hard for Doug not to take us on a detour down memory lane. It brings me back to when I was driving these when they were newer. And most of those memories are nothing but good, right? You might remember when you were racing your buddy. Uh, you might 
remember the first time you went on a date. You might remember your first kiss, who knows? Cars have long been considered a milestone of technological innovation. Even when today, automakers are starting to go retro, reminiscent of the way they maybe looked in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Throughout 2022, the collector online auction site Bring a Trailer saw a 50% increase in year-over-year -year sales. By year's end, over $1.3 billion in transactions flowed through the site, crushing the site's previous record of $859 million in 2021. Manual transmissions have also been on the rise. In 2021, stick shift enthusiasts comprised only 0.9% of the U.S. auto market. By 2022, that number rose to 1.2%. And sales figures for the first few months of this year indicate that number has already hit 1.7%. The service business has turned out to be absolutely incredible. There's such a demand to repair these cars. It's meant big business for collector dealerships like Shooks and major manufacturers as they put the future of their profits in the chassis of their legends. When most of us think about the past, we, we have positive thoughts and, and the auto industry really does well to, to capture that. Tyson Jomini is the vice president of data and analytics for J.D. Power, and he says the reason is simple. Manufacturers want to ensure their bottom line as their industry transitions into a future full of risk with electric vehicles. I mean, as EVs come in, they're a very risky proposition. It requires a, a very substantial upfront investment in a new technology. It requires new plants, destroying or old plants to make new ones. And so you have all this risk. And so a great way to offset some of that risk is to apply it to a nameplate or a model that people are familiar with. Um, and so it helps to sort of bring the old customer base up to current levels and where we are, where the industry is going. So it's a nice blend of, of risk uh, mitigation with, with that nostalgic feeling. Dodge plans to take the signature roar of its muscle and play through an electronic speaker when it releases its new Charger next year. Ford did the same thing last year when it made its F-150, the best-selling pickup in America for more than four decades, fully electric. I never thought I'd see the day where the 70s cars and the 80 cars would be popular. Injecting a classic feel in a market defined by relentless innovation. Dan Grossman, Scripps News, Denver.